And you know, one of the big criticisms for new film makers is that they just want to make movies about themselves. Well, even Steely Dan put a line or two in a song about that kind of stuff. But what happens if one of your life experiences includes being involved with one of the largest hostage situations in America? Cinematic class is about to begin, and your professor is in. Say good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am your cinematic professor and purveyor of truth in movies. And tonight's lesson plan is a movie called A Clear Shot. We have a uh, situation here where the writer and director, Nick Leisure, was actually involved in this when he was a young man. Apparently, uh, this situation uh, still ranks, as of uh, today, this taping, as the largest hostage rescue operation uh, uh, here in America. There were 40 hostages uh, taken this uh, day, and the situation and how it is resolved is all worked around in this story. It pulls, of course, from true events, but there is obviously... A, uh, a, a good deal of fiction uh, tossed into this as well, because, well, you know, we do have to put in those agendas. So, okay, we're talking about agendas. What agendas are you actually talking about? Well, some of them you're going to be pretty familiar with. For example, there is uh, the good old template story, once the hostage crisis erupts, which division of the police is going to be responsible and take charge. Uh, we have the, the typical cops, okay, the LAPD, and then we have the sheriff's department. These guys are really gung-ho because they uh, they have the SWAT team, okay? And then stuck in the middle is poor Detective Gomez. He's played by Mario Van Peebles. Mario does a pretty nice job in this. Normally in his movies, he, he's playing a secondary character, but he takes front and center on this and does a fairly nice job. He is trying to resolve the situation uh, in a peaceful method where no one gets hurt, either the hostages or uh, the people inside. Uh, and of course, his counterpart is the sheriff who commands the SWAT team who wants to go in all, you know, Leroy Jenkins type of thing. <laughs> so there's your one conflict. The other conflict comes in the form of uh, immigration. We have four uh, Viet Vietnamese youths who have uh, gone in to rob this store. Let me give you these names here and hopefully I won't butcher them up too much. Uh, the four guys who, who try to pull the heist are Hao Do, Tony Du, uh, Kevin Batch, and Dang Tran. Now, uh, they play different characters. For example, uh, Dang plays Chong. He's the one that's, you know, he's the youngest of the four and he he wants to go Rambo on everything. Uh, we have Pham. Uh, Kevin plays Pham, and he's kind of like the guy that wants to be a little bit responsible and cool things out. We have Long. Uh, he's another one in for, and we have Loy. Loy is the, boy, he's the guy that doesn't want to be there, uh, and, and he's kind of the, the, the weak link, I guess, in the chain. What about the immigration situation? Ah, this incident happened back in 1991. But very surprisingly, we have 2,020 beans. So what we have here is uh, naturally we're trying to draw some kind of empathy uh, for the for the four youths who go and, and try to rob this electronics store. Kind of neat. It was originally in <laughs> in real life. It was the Good Guys electronics store. I, I don't think Good Guys stuck around too long. They were pretty big back in the day, but, uh, you know, they, I don't think they ever turned out to be as big as uh, uh, some of the other uh, big electronics stores uh, at the time. A in any event, I don't want to diverge on that. 
uh, because what, what Nick has done in this movie is, uh, instead of using good guys, because <laughs> the company, I think, is defunct and uh, probably didn't want to get the rights for it, he turns it into Leisure Electronics, which is kind of cool because he put his own last name in there. And <laughs> since he was there, that's kind of a cool thing to do, I thought. Anyways, okay. So what we have here are uh, immigrants who are uh, basically uh, fed up. Uh, they came over, I guess, expecting uh, streets flowing with gold and, you know, riches and a land flowing of milk and honey. And, then, you know, when they found out that when you get to America, uh, you pretty much have to work for what you get. Nothing is handed to you unless, of course, you live in the backyard of one of these uh, progressive liberals, in which case, <laughs> a different story. Um, and they get a little frustrated because they're not being able to cut the mustard. Part of that is probably they're not assimilating into American culture. And you could see that through their father in this story, who really wants to you know, hold on to old ways and not be an American. And that therein lies the rub, I guess. So anyway, they figure, well, look, they can get their you know young brother off into college and get him all kind of uh, set up to, to, to break the, the shackles you know, of immigration or what have you. And they decide to rob the store. Everything that could possibly go wrong goes wrong. And it ends up being a hostage situation with over 40 people inside. And naturally, you have a multicultural group inside the store as hostage. And then naturally, you have a pregnant woman. What would hostage taking be if you didn't have somebody and you got an old person? You know, you, you got to have these people in there because they add to the story. And then the, the whole scheme of, of how uh, Detective Gomez tries to talk to these four guys and calm the situation down is he's using the immigration arguments that you see today, especially from the progressive left. You know, nobody who crosses our border is ever a criminal. We're all just good guys. Things just go wrong, you know. It's that type of attitude. And in his big speech before the climatic reels, you know, he's talking about he was an immigrant too, and his parents were immigrants. And, you know, you got to fight through this and you got to, you know, the, all, all that stuff that you, you always hear and, and makes the headlines and the, uh, you know, Trump's building a wall, but one person somewhere stubbed their toe on the wall, therefore we shouldn't build it. That type of nonsense is tossed in there. So I don't know if they were quite arguing all of those different uh, tenants back in 1991. I don't recall it if they were. So you have very modern mores being uh, fused into an incident that happened, what, uh, two, three decades ago. So, hey, I already mentioned Nick Leisure as the writer and director of A Clear Shot. Now you have the editor in here who is uh, uh, Peter Brewer. And uh, Pete's got a little bit of a problem with this, with this movie. Some of the edits are very, very uh, choppy. You know, I'm a big fan, and I think most viewers are, of the seamless edit. And some of these are just a little bit too abrupt and, and uh, distracting to a very flow uh, narrative. And there's at least one uh, sequence where the segments seem to be misplaced. It's where uh, Detective Gomez is arguing with the sheriff who wants to uh, go in blazing with the SWAT team. And it appears as if they should be like this, but they, you see them like this. Okay, The one segment uh, should come before so that you have the thing set up, but you don't see it that way. And I think there was just a mistake in, in putting it together. Now, those little foibles aside, you'll see some pretty decent uh, acting from Van Peebles and the four characters who try to rob the store. And and uh, you do get a, a pretty good uh, oh, a little peek behind the curtain, I guess, of some of the uh, police politics going on as far as the, uh, you know, who's going to take charge. And then more importantly, who's going to take the blame if this whole thing goes wrong. All told, this is not a bad cop film. Pretty decent to watch. I enjoyed it. Now that you have learned what you have learned, you're end of your lesson.